Well, good afternoon, everyone, and I appreciate that opening message from Allison Evans, and thank you so much for our host today. Um, we're delighted that all of you in the audience could be with us. It is an honor to have you join us for this second program of the Global U.S. Brain Trust Quarterly Dialogue Series. My name is Melissa Mitchell, and I am Executive Director of the Global Coalition on Aging. At GCOA, we are envisioning a future in which the longevity that was gifted to us in the 20th century is viewed positively despite many challenges that this 21st century has brought us. Challenges like Alzheimer's and other dementias, the threat of loneliness and isolation, particularly as we age, the caregiving burden for older loved ones that disproportionately falls on women, and other vulnerabilities like those demonstrated during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we do that by advocating for innovations and engaging with innovators like so many here today to work together towards solutions that ensure that each of us has a chance to maximize the potential of our long lives by staying in good health for as long as possible. I am honored to be in seeing this discussion today because that is exactly what the Global and U.S. Brain Trusts are working hard to do every day. These networks of influential women leaders across Europe and the U.S. serving as ambassadors of the Be Brain Powerful campaign are helping to empower women worldwide to take charge of their own brain and mental health. And healthier brains means healthier aging and healthier futures for us all. I think I speak for all of us when I say we're coming together in a pivotal moment for the global future of brain and mental health here amidst the silent pandemic of Alzheimer's disease and this global tragedy that we're seeing with war in Ukraine. So with that, I'd like to now introduce Andrea Pfeiffer, Chair of the Global Brain Trust and Co-Founder and Chief Executive Officer of AC Immune, who is joined today by leading experts to have this very critical conversation. Andrea, welcome. Thank, thank you so much, Me uh, Melissa. It's a real pleasure to have you as a moderator today for this important subject. And I also would like to thank our audience and speakers for joining us today to discuss the impact of trauma on brain and mental health. Why do we focus on this aspect today? Well, it's almost obvious. The global environment for mental health is changing rapidly, bringing drama to the forefront of everyone's concern. First, there was a global pandemic leading to lockdowns, social isolation, pressure on the job market, personal and financial situations. And now there is a war in the heart of Europe, leading to women and children fleeing their homes leaving loved ones behind and vis witnessing horrific scenes of violence. In previous dialogues, we focused, um, as Melissa mentioned, uh, on the importance of preserving our brain and mental health to prevent cognitive decline. This is, of course, a, a very big concern to me. We want to prevent diseases like Alzheimer's, but it is also extremely well established that certain psychiatric conditions such as depression, anxiety, as we are facing right now, are also associated in some way with cognitive decline and possibly dementia. And it has been documented that a history of depression, anxiety is one more time very common in women. So these are the reasons why today's discussion is um, timelier than ever. Today, we are focusing on trauma caused by external factors and political events that are not in our control, but still have a significant impact on our brain and mental health. In the first part of our discussion, we will talk about the impact of COVID and trauma on our brain and mental health, really focusing on the signs and in the second part, we are looking at what can be practically done to reduce, to ease the trauma on our mental health and uh, give hope, give hope which we are all looking for. With that uh, small introduction, I would like to invite now Dr. Murali Duraswani to join um, this discussion. Hello. 
Great. Hi, Morali. It's a real pleasure to be together again on a panel. We have uh, some experience when we were together in the WEF. Um, I mean, it's almost um, uh, not necessary to introduce you, but uh, I would say a few words about your extraordinary work. So you have a co-chair, you really have two, two hats. One is a co-chair of a Global Future Council on Mental Health at the World Economic Forum. The second, the professor of psychiatry and medicine at the Duke University. And at the same time, you're advising governments, businesses, advocacy groups, such as NIH, FDA, WHO, and the WEF, where it's basically almost no committee where your name doesn't show up. <laughs> um, the work, your work has a strong scientific component, and this is really how can we diagnose better? I mean, I was reading some of your papers recently, which is really absolutely to a point we need, we need to diagnose early. But then you also contributed to leading products in the cognitive and psychiatric uh, conditions, and you are even a book author. So, I mean, it's very wide <laughs> what you're doing. So that's why we are extremely honored that you could join us today and discuss a bit more. And we are, I think, all interested in the audience what is actually the biological, what is the science behind trauma on our brain and mental health? So if I may uh, start with um, one of the important questions, how do you see that COVID-19 has actually changed the, the mental health uh, aspect? Is the focus today really uh, shifted? How have in particular young people, women, suffered um, from this pandemic? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to this wonderful forum and thank you for this very gracious introduction. It's such an honor to be amongst so many distinguished uh, people in the audience. And I love the slogan, Be Brain Powerful, because uh, this is May is National Mental Health Month, at least in the US, and that's a wonderful, wonderful slogan. So I think let's move back before the COVID-19 pandemic Two and a half years ago, mental health was already a major worldwide crisis. Uh, we knew that it was the leading cause of disability. We knew that suicide was the second leading cause of death amongst young people. But still, we as a society did not do anything about it. Uh, we were grossly underinvested. There was a 70 to 80% shortage of therapists and clinicians and stigma continues to be a huge problem. So we always thought about mental health as that other person's problem, not our problem. And what COVID has done was horrific. Of course, millions of people died, uh, several hundred million people contracted COVID, the pandemic mitigation measures really brought home the importance of our own mental health. And for the first time, we started seeing the rise in anxiety, depression amongst our friends, family members, the bereavement that many of us suffered when we lost loved ones, and then especially the young, uh, as you mentioned, the young people, uh, the CDC did a poll uh, a few months ago that found something like 25% of young adults were uh, reporting suicidal ideation. So we don't know how this is going to progress in coming years, whether there will be a substantially sharp increase in suicides. But the bottom line, the one silver lining, if I may say so, is I think the whole world has realized the importance of fixing a suboptimal mental health system. So now it's chance for us as a society to come together to put structures and systems in place that outlast the pandemic. The good news is many, many innovative thinkers have come forward to help. For example, we see telemedicine, the rise of uh, community-based mental health services, digital health solutions, a number of these I think are promising approaches, but we need to do more. And I think this is that we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to fix it. Thank you. Um, my next question goes really to the science, and I couldn't resist to ask you this question because when I read this Nature paper, which came out a few weeks ago, um, I have to admit I was a sort of shocked. Um, basically, this paper shows that there is a, a real impact on the biology, the structure of the brain um, by COVID-19, and um, and we don't know exactly if this is just a temporary thing or a, a longer thing. So what is your view? Are we really here looking at um, 
something which is observed, uh, but when it goes away, or do we have to expect uh, even a higher rate of Alzheimer coming from this COVID-19? That's a wonderful question. I would say in many ways, that's the billion dollar question we don't have all the answers to. But mm -hmm. let me backtrack a bit. The paper that you're referring to in the mm -hmm. prestigious journal Nature was a study of about 700 or so individuals enrolled in something called the UK Biobank. These people were having annual or biannual brain MRI scans. And it so happened that about half of these individuals contracted COVID. Now, these were not people that got very severe COVID and were hospitalized and had encephalitis, et cetera. These were people for the most part had very mild COVID. And the researchers were asking a very interesting question. They said, yeah, we know severe COVID can damage the brain, can cause confusion, delirium. But what about very mild cases of COVID? Can it change the structure of the brain? And they found that, yes, they found there was shrinkage of the brain in several key regions. And they also found that people who had mild COVID experienced sharper cognitive decline over time. Now, of course, the study is not fully definitive. We don't know all of the confounding factors. But I think it's supported by a range of other evidence. For example, we know viruses get into the brain and can cause cognitive impairment and dementia. Everybody has heard of syphilis-related dementia. Everybody has now knows that HIV, the virus uh, that's related to AIDS, can cause dementia. So we, there's also theories that certain microbes and viruses may be linked to Alzheimer's disease. We know that 30% of people who survive COVID hospitalization experience what is called as long COVID neurological symptoms, including loss of smell, fatigue, aches and pains, neuropathy, and cognitive decline. We know there is a bi-directional relationship between COVID and cognitive impairment and dementia. We know people with dementia had a higher rate of contracting COVID and dying from COVID. We also know that amongst those who recovered from COVID, there is a higher incidence of both mild cognitive impairment and dementia. The real question is, is this a new entity that we are going to call as COVID dementia? Or is this really what we are calling as Alzheimer's that is triggered by a viral infection in the brain? I think that remains to be seen, but it's a very, very important area for research. Yeah, you can imagine it goes very close to my heart. Um, now moving from dementia and COVID to the Ukraine. Um, in my own environment, I saw so many families, young people, myself actually, to be really impacted by this war. So from your perspective as a scientist, again, do you see any biological clinical impacts of a trauma on the brain? And what can we do about it? Well, of course, uh, there is substantial impact of trauma on the brain, especially very severe, serious types of trauma. Um, so there's two questions. One is what are the immediate impacts? Second is what are the lasting impacts? And an even more interesting question is what are the intergenerational impacts? In other words, are there changes at the genetic and molecular level that can be passed on to future generations? So I think the immediate impacts are very obvious to everyone, right? Very profound, um, you know, loss of identity, anxiety, stress, uh, insomnia, uh, nightmares, um, you know, uh, depression, anxiety, potentially leading to PTSD. So those are clear sort of acute consequences, but fortunately many of them uh, can recover from it if they are provided the appropriate psychosocial support, support and um, are able to sort of uh, uh, talk through their trauma with, um, you know, in a supportive environment. So that's why psychosocial and mental support is so crucial, uh, what we call a psychological first aid uh, in the immediate phase. Now, the longer term sequelae are a little harder to predict because it depends on what the environment that they then get. Uh, if they have a very supportive environment, a nurturing environment, you can prevent or mitigate both the long term consequences and the future consequences. That's why it's so important for us as a society to come together to make sure that um, uh, we can help all of those who are in distress and trauma. Thank you. My last question, um, and just maybe a short response. Um, parents with children showing um, alarming signs of trauma, what do you think are these signs? And when do you ask for professional help? Or how can we support mothers, families in this question? 
Yeah, I think um, you know children um, are going to be affected uh, are going to be affected very profoundly. Uh, so children are very very vulnerable to um, any signs of loss of security uh, in their parents. So uh, chronic stress can affect children differently depending on the age. For example, older kids like adolescents and teens might rebel, sleep more, become withdrawn, uh, use drugs. Whereas younger kids who are even more sensitive to their parents' fears, you know, when security is breached, um, you know, you can see signs like crying, clinging, bedwetting, nightmares. You know, every time a siren goes off, you know, you may see, uh, you know, the child sort of reacting uh, uh, in a way that's uh, uh, concerning. So I think, I think the key is to, um, uh, you know, provide a supportive environment, a routine, um, you know, um, really uh, get them involved in hobbies, nature, uh, and, and, and sort of reassure them. Uh, but also, I think, provide mental health evaluation if these symptoms get severe and they persist for several weeks. Thank you, Marley. I mean, I'm, I think everybody would agree that there would be a lot of uh, questions still to ask you. We need to move forward, and I do hope that you can actually stay for the second part because we will actually uh, move now to um, the uh, Patricia Foundation and to Constanze Egger, who actually showed in a very pragmatic way, and I was really impressed when I heard the first time about this foundation, what can be done by education? How can you switch things to a positive, give hope and change things around? So I welcome now uh, Constanze Egger. It's my pure pleasure. Um, and um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, as I said, I hope you can stay with us and because you will be uh, impressed also by this very practical approach. And as you rightly said, education. So um, just a few words. I mean, Constanze had a very international career, became a um, business economist, spending time in many countries. Um, was also a PR specialist and uh, has an MBA in systemic organization development. And in addition to all of that, she's a founder, uh, was very instrumental in Patricia Foundation uh, creation, which goes back to uh, 1999, whose vision is actually to give access to education for children and young people worldwide. And as we can see and say, this is timelier than ever. Today, 23 years later, we are 20 kinder house facilities operating in Europe, Africa, Asia, South America, that honor the foundation's motto, building better future. And um, as we discussed last time, we really in this dialogue, we want to always come up with how can we give hope? What can we do to make this a better world? Um, with that now, um, I would like to move to the first question for Constanze and ask her what actually led to the impactful mission and vision of this Patricia Foundation to provide this education and how did the pandemic impact the foundation's activity? Yeah, Andrea, first of all, uh, also, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to enter into conversation with you. It's a great honor for us to be able to exchange views in this wonderful round. We have a great deal of respect uh, for the contribution you are making with the Brain uh, Trust. Thank you very much for the work. Actually, our first project was a children's hospital in Tanzania. My brother Wolfgang visited the Benedictine mission, mission uh, there in 1999, uh, which we have been supporting as a family for many, many years. The visit uh, left a deep impression on him. He was, uh, inspired, was very inspired by the heroic work of the sisters uh, we're doing there in the middle of Norway. Uh, we talked about it uh, at that time, and it was uh, immediately clear for me that I wanted to be involved from the beginning uh, on. So our roots are in the healthcare. We have deep uh, connections with this sector, and in the current crisis, uh, we can use this strong network to help children and their families affected by the trauma of a war. In the foundation itself, it's a 
uh, we uh, gradually shifted on our focus on education, as you told uh, already, Andrea. We want to make a long-term impact. We believe that providing high quality education is the best way to do this for us. By giving children access to a good education, we empower them, but put them in position to lead independent and self-determined lives. We want to impact generations, not just offer, put on band aid and leave again. No, we are there for generations. That's our family we are thinking. Uh, our work in the last couple of years was very heavily impacted by the pandemic. Uh, you uh, will understand, of course. At the beginning of the pandemic, all our schools and hospitals had to close. We set up immediately the Corona Fund Healthcare uh, Education Fund and uh, were able to help them to navigate through the difficult time. All our schools and hospitals are now in this year running again. At the start of this year, we thought we could leave the pandemic behind. We were hoping for a return to normality Unfortunately, there are a number of negative long-term consequences caused by the pandemic. As the WHO reports, ancients and depression have risen sharply and access to mental health care is insufficient on a global level. Some girls have not returned at school at all, and this will uh, be not very good for all of us. Thank you, uh, Constanze. Let's maybe then just uh, move a bit uh, to the war um, in the time we're mining. So we have now this war and uh, people are fleeing the Ukraine. Of course, women again and children are uh, most affected. So how can we, how do you, how does your foundation deal with actually what is invisible, the mental health of mostly women and children who cross the border? How uh, do you sort of bring in your foundation? I know I was extremely impressed because you were looking at it and you were not just talking, but you were immediately taking action. So I, again, I find this, I was very impressed about that. So tell us, how, how did you immediately show um, help uh, to, for women and, and, and families to deal with the situation? Yes, we are taking action in several ways. And most importantly, we take immediate action without being encumbered uh, by red tape. We are providing emergency pedagogic on the ground in Poland, for example. The most important thing is to establish a secure framework and a safe space for the children. They need to have the chance to express themselves without feeling pushed or pressured. Our staff trains volunteers as well. As I mentioned, we are also working with a tr our trusted and long-term partners like the Palantines. We help finance their work through the new fund, uh, the Educare Europe Fund, which Angelica, uh, my colleague, uh, is also with me, will tell you more about. Great. So let me then introduce the two uh, colleagues which you brought, um, Angelika uh, Jacobi and uh, Beatrice sotishauser Ram. Uh, Beatrice is a really trained um, educationalist who has been working for more than 20 years uh, as emergency educationalist. And then Angelika, who in fact is responsible for this Educare uh, Europe Fund. And uh, so if I may turn to Beatrice. So in what ways are these kinderhouse facilities uh, in these countries working to limit this traumatic, post-traumatic stress on children? How can we bring back hope? Yeah, every, every crisis uh, has an impact on the learning. And, and, and that is because schools are closed. The, the children want to support their, their families. 
and uh, they also lose the interest of learning. So, so um, it is important that they have some self-learning tools, that their intrinsic motivation to learn is continuously because it's not the school book who, 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 who is interesting them for learning. It is the real life. And when we find the mathematics, the language, all these aspects in, in, in their surrounding, then they, they start to open again and to find tools uh, and, and they activate their self-learning tools. They, they all have, we all have them uh, in order to, to explore new, new aspects for their learning. <laughs> That, right. is, that is actually the, the, the aspect, yeah. And these self-learning tools, uh, th these are also the ones we need to activate uh, for, from the children who have caused a trauma because they don't want to memorize. They are always afraid if they think back on their, what there is memorized that some flashbacks are coming up. So we have to create always the learning aspect in a new way and not out of the brain, but with our hands. And, and that is what the joy brings back because they say themselves, uh, you know, the, the numbers are falling out of my head. I cannot memorize again. And, and that is actually, we have to change our methods. And these are methods uh, we also use in generally in the child-centered learning. So we have to activate uh, the teachers to, 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 uh, to, that they know these tools. And, and as I say, a handful of pet bottle cups is maybe joying uh, the children because they can explore the mathematic again. Wow, very nice. Um, Angelica, um, you're not only a foundation board member, you are managing director of, um, of a foundation uh, also responsible for this Europe fund. Tell us about it. What is this fund doing? And how can maybe the audience also participate in your mission? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrea. Yes, and you mentioned it. We set up the Educare Europe Fund at the very beginning of the war in Ukraine. And for us, it was important to actually do something, not just to make a statement uh, condemning the war. So we have already released 250,000 euro from the fund, and we do support only those activities that are fully, fully funded from the foundation. So currently the money is going to Germany and Poland. With this money, our partner organizations can set up child-friendly spaces, for example, where children and their families experience a safe and nurturing environment. And I think this was mentioned before also from our previous speak, speaker, how important it is that children have a safe environment. So we are setting up such a space for 200 women and children at the moment on the outskirts of Warsaw in Poland. But we see a lot of different activities also, like a Ukrainian school on Saturdays, for example, language courses for young people and many more. So we are reaching hundreds of children, young adults and their mothers in the different initiatives that we are supporting. And we are glad that we are able to help and we want to do even more. So we are grateful for every contribution that allows to lessen the suffering of children and their families. Everybody who wants to help with a donation and help us make a further activity possible can easily find the Educare Europe Fund on our website. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I, as I said, I was quite impressed about the speed you managed to put this in place. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably a model. I mean, you're mainly working in Poland and Germany, but it's maybe a model which we can sort of um, migrate uh, globally, more globally. Um, and I'm sure there will be many questions from the audience, um, which we will collect and, and forward to you. In closing, we are actually already at the closing time, but um, Constanze, just in one minute, um, what makes you hopeful for the future? My personal uh, guiding principle is always uh, energy follows attention. I can focus on the negative, but uh, then I also stop seeing the good. It's everyone's uh, personal choice. We focus on our valuable impact and the ability to make a difference, no matter how bad the situation seems at the moment. And uh, believe me, everyone can do something. 
even if it is only that everybody from us here recommends us to five of their friends, for example. Even such small things sometimes have an immense effect. And that makes me feel very hopeful that networks carry us and we can influence the world in a positive way. Thank you so much, um, Constanze, Angelica, and Beatrix, for your impressive work. I was really stimulated. I'm sure the audience was as well. And um, thank you for giving us hope that something can be done to protect or ease traumatic experiences of children, um, women. And um, yeah, and uh, we will be looking at the Patricia Foundation for the activity and in our monthly newsletter, we will come back and give links so that people can contact you because I'm sure there are many people would like to know more about your work. Thank you very much. And with that, I give back to Melissa. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you, Constance and Beatrice and Angelica. Um, for that wonderful sort of overview of the great work that's happening um, at the Patricia Foundation. And thank you, Dr. Duraswamy, for um, the earlier session as well. We're taking a lot into this next portion. Um, as I think about what we've been saying here today, I, I go back to what the World Health Organization defines as being healthy and healthy aging. And that's really according to one's functional ability. And that's about having the capabilities that enable us, all of us to be and do what we have reason to value. And this should be a goal for all people at all ages and all geographies. And in trying times like these, we really need innovations to ensure that, to, to ensure we have safety and, and education and all of these things that are contributing to all of us to be able to be as healthy as possible for as long as possible. So thank you for, for all these insights. And so what we'll talk about next um, is how we can maintain this, our functional ability by way of our brain health um, and so let's move into a conversation to explore prevention and the role that sex and gender plays in brain health, because I think with our mission about being brain powerful and really empowering women, I'm really excited to now have uh, Mara Hank Murray joining us today. Um, she is vice chair of the Global Brain Trust, who spearheads the Be Brain Powerful campaign. And I'm delighted that Mara and I will be interviewing our next guest together. So Mara, I am going to now turn it to you to um, introduce and begin the discussion with Dr. Lisa Moscone. Thank you so much, Melissa. So I'm pleased now to introduce Dr. Lisa Moscone, a world-renowned scientist and director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Program at Weill Cornell Medicine. Dr. Moscone is the author of the New York Times and Der Spiegel best-selling The XX Brain, and of the international bestseller Brain Food, which has been published in over 25 countries and translated into more than 15 languages. Thank you so much, Dr. Moscone, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So as I mentioned before, I love your books and there's so many questions I could ask you, <laughs> um, but I think I want to start with what drove you as a researcher to focus on sex-based differences in the brain. And what has your latest work with the magnetic resonance imaging to scan the brains of women pre and post menopausal uncovered? Yeah, so I've been working in this field pretty much since I was 18 years old, in part because of my family. I have a fairly strong family history of Alzheimer's disease that really affects the women in my family. So my grandmother was one of four siblings, three sisters and one brother. And all three sisters developed dementia and died of it, whereas the brother was scared, was spared. I was scared, the brother was spared. And so back then I was already studying the brain, which has always been my passion. And I started asking questions as I was entering my PhD program. I have a PhD in neuroscience and nuclear medicine, which is a branch of radiology. And so I've been looking at, at, at brains pretty much my entire career starting very, very, at a very young age. And, and my question was, is it just me? Is it just my family? Is my mom at risk for Alzheimer's disease? Am I at risk for Alzheimer's disease? Does it matter if you're a woman or a man? And back then, the, the answer that I always got, was, well, not quite. The point is that Alzheimer's disease is a disease of old age and women live longer than men. So in the end, there are more women than men suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And still today, almost two thirds of all Alzheimer's patients are women. 
Now, a few decades later, mm -hmm. really, we know better and we realize that women don't live that much longer than men, right? The, the, the age difference in the United States is about four and a half years. In England, the difference is two and a half years, but Alzheimer's disease and dementia are the number one cause of death for women and not men. But most importantly than all this, we and others have shown that Alzheimer's disease is not a disease of old age, but rather it starts in midlife with negative changes in the brain that later on lead to the onset of clinical symptoms when people are in their 70s or 80s. And so what we have done was then to really think about it differently and ask a different question. So if Alzheimer's disease starts in midlife and not in old age, what happens to women and not men in midlife that could potentially clarify why more women than men develop Alzheimer's disease? And that's how we stumbled on menopause, which was very strange for me. You know, in Western medicine, we were not really trained to think you know, menopause is something that a brain person should concern themselves with. But it turns out that menopause is actually a neuroendocrine transition, which means that your brain and your hormones are all changing at the same time. And we have shown using brain scans that as women go through perimenopause, so even before menopause, those you know, few years of turmoil where you have the hot flashes, the night sweats, insomnia, anxiety, depression, memory lapses, those years are really marked by the onset, the emergence of Alzheimer's plaques in women's brains. And that was incredibly scary for me. So then I, I started looking into prevention even more, which I know is why we're here today. I'm gonna jump in on that, Lisa, Dr. Yeah. Moscone. I think it, it's clearly very fascinating and lets us think about when we should be, begin thinking about this. Yes. Um, and we've talked today about trauma because we're thinking about like how our hormones are working um, and research does indicate that women with lower levels of estrogen at the time mm -hmm. of trauma may be vulnerable to developing PTSD. And so you also explore that relationship between estrogen levels in women's bodies and the development of Alzheimer's coat. So tell us a little bit more about this intersection, what this means for women, what we should be doing, what we should be thinking about for some of the women that we've been talking about in this conversation today. Yeah, so what we have shown is that there's a very close relationship between estrogen levels, especially um, estradiol levels, and brain health in women. And we've been looking at it from the Alzheimer's prevention lens, but in reality, it's a connection that really spans from neurology to psychiatry to, to all the brain disciplines, because it's not just Alzheimer's disease risk that is higher in women. Women also have a higher risk of anxiety and depression, as compared to men, but we also have a higher risk of multiple sclerosis. We have a higher risk of developing a brain tumor after menopause. We have a higher risk of dying from a stroke. And all these factors seem to be activated by menopause, which is a connection that's been really dramatically overlooked in the neuroscience fields, in neurology, in psychiatry, psychology. We don't talk about this enough unless we're making fun women's hormones and women's brains, right? So I think it's really important to change this conversation and state very clearly, we're not our hormones. However, our hormones do play an important role. And to your point of PTSD and trauma and stress, overall, sex hormones work in balance with stress hormones. So the body, when you're under stress, your body produces high levels of cortisol, the main stress hormone. And in order to be able to do that, it shifts the production of hormones away from the sex hormones to make the cortisol. So if your cortisol is high, if your stress is high, your sex hormones go down. So if you've reduced your stress levels, your body will be able to also resume production of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and whatnot, which is really important for preventative reasons and also for mental health reasons really. So reducing stress doesn't just save your day, it also saves your brain. And I think as scientists for many, many, for a very long time, I think that uh, stress reduction techniques were considered a little bit like new agey or a little bit experimental, if you will. Whereas now it's really well established that things like meditation, for example, have incredibly positive effects on brain health at any age, but especially in midlife. 
So tell us how we can take all these lessons about stress. We're women, we, we multitask, we have anxiety. Oh so what, what's the step we could take to, to make sure that we are monitoring and better regulating uh, the stress hormones in our body? And how do we take the steps to going into meditation and making sure that we are focusing on that and making ourselves brain powerful? Do you meditate? Do, do you guys like to meditate? Uh-huh. I asked the question because I need lessons <laughs> on it. <laughs> I do, well, I do actually I, meditate. You so. do meditate. Oh, I, really. I have to really push myself to do it because I'm always like running like 3000 miles an hour. But I think that the research really convinced me that it is important to include meditation as a brain protective strategy and really make it as part of your daily life. Or if you can't do daily, at least a part of your life. And I, I think in order to manage stress, um, you effectively also manage your heart health and your brain health because the, the stress reduction techniques that we have available to us are really working as an integrated medicine approach. So there's, there's stress reduction through meditation if you like meditation, but if you don't, you can exercise and exercise is a wonderful uh, lifestyle tool that is also very personal right? I like running, but not everybody can run, or maybe they don't like running. And so the elliptical machine is a good strategy. And if you don't like the elliptical, maybe you'll do squats. And if you don't like doing squats, maybe you walk. But as long as exercise is done consistently, I think there's enough evidence that supports consistent exercise as an Alzheimer's preventative strategy. And obviously, it reduces stress levels and improves sleep, which is another big factor involved in stress reduction and one that most women I know at least struggle with, or most women on the planet really mm. struggle with. And diet is also very, very important for both hormonal health, Alzheimer's prevention, and in some ways stress reduction as well, because some foods and nutrients really support hormonal health. And insulin is another hormone that is regulated in part by food. And they all play a role in mental health. So I would say meditation, if you can, I would strongly recommend uh, Kirtan Kriya to know if you heard about it. Uh, it's a 12 minute meditation that comes from the Kundalini yoga tradition, but is scientifically validated to really improve blood flow to the brain, reduce cortisol levels, and obviously reduce stress, especially in women. And it takes 12 minutes and uh, is freely available in the Alzheimer's Research Prevention Foundation actually has the whole practice on their website. That's wonderful, thank you. I mean, we're talking about prevention and we're looking at you know, the Be Brain Powerful campaign. And yeah. as you know, it's designed to help women to focus on self-care, yeah. on a healthy diet and exercise. And I mean, I truly believe in that it's never too late to make those key lifestyle changes and to sort of see the benefit in our brain health. But if you could say, I mean, we've gone into meditation, you've talked about the diet a bit, but what would be your top line recommendations and that are applicable to women, but also what is applicable to our entire families? Because at the end of the day, yeah. we keep on sort of you know, talking about women, and we do this because we're talking about how can we be the ones that bring it to the rest of our families, to our husbands, to our brothers, to our sisters, to our children. Yes. So what would be your recommendations? Well, look, as I, I have, a, my daughter was five when the, not even five, when the pandemic started. And that really led to a reconsideration of our lifestyle as a, as a family, especially when it comes to sleep and stress reduction, I had her meditate. We started mm -hmm. doing nighttime meditations for kids and she loved it. And she actually didn't have such a hard time during the pandemic. So I think we did something <laughs> right. I, I hope we did something right. But I think exercise is really important and spending time in nature turns out to be really helpful for brain health for the entire family. And I, I always tell my daughter that we need to swap screen time for green time and really spend time outdoors as much as well. I'm not an outdoor person, I'll be honest. My husband makes fun of me for that. But we, we do try to like, grow plants in the house and just go out for walks and really limit the amount of time that we spend in front of a TV or a screen, which is very hard to do these days. Um, and just be physically active, whether, it, whether it's going out for a walk or for a run or get on the bike 
if you can, as a family, that is really beneficial. I think really eliminating processed foods from the diet is a strong line of defense. Eliminating perhaps is too much, but minimizing the amount of processed food in the diet is really, really important and focusing on foods that provide nutrients that are really supportive of your whole body and brain health. So antioxidants are key, fresh fruit, vegetables, healthy fats from nuts and seeds. What we had done was to really switch to a much more plant-based diet. I've been a vegetarian pretty much my whole adult life with some fish here and there. Hmm. But we made the conscious decision to go very much plant-based because fiber is really helpful for your whole health and for regulating blood sugar levels and hormonal levels all at once. And it's great for digestion and it really it supports also clarity and it's a great tool against brain fog. They're not that a lot of people because of the anxiety, the stress, lots and lots of people have been also coming to us, to the clinic, to the research because of brain fog. And also drinking water. We completely underestimate the importance of drinking water, but the brain is 80% water. And even minimal dehydration, like a two to 4% water loss can really trigger neurological symptoms from mm -hmm. confusion to the brain fog that everybody dreads and dizziness, confusion, and the memory lapses, the lack of attention. So I strongly recommend drinking water, which seems very simple, but it really, it, it was shown in, in clinical trials or in experimental studies to improve reaction times by up to 20%, just simply drinking a, a glass of water before taking a test. So I drink water all day long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that would be my, my top recommendations for the family, just simplify. Take it easy, simplify, try to focus on the presence and be grateful for what you have and try to stay grounded and just structure. If you have children, especially structure, just make sure that they don't feel unsafe. And we, we were talking about trauma for children before, just, just try to remain calm. <laughs> and yeah, I think exercise, meditation, making time for self-care as well. You mentioned, Melissa, you mentioned self-care and this is something that so many women just don't have time for. I think midlife is a time in a woman's life where you really need to make time for you. Because honestly, at the end of the day, your health in midlife is the strongest predictor of your health for the rest mm -hmm. of your life. And we all want our cognitive lifespan and our mental health lifespan to match our actual lifespan. So these little these things that these life, lifestyle steps may sound like easy and simple, but they're very hard to do consistently and consistency is key. Thank you so much for that. It's exactly, I think, what we all need to hear. And sometimes people forget that it is the simple steps, but that they're so important, you know, to being, like we say, brain powerful and to maintaining sort of this force between us. Um, I always say that the only way to be, you know, the best person for everyone in my family is if I'm well, um, starting off in my health and my exercise. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mosconi. It's been such a pleasure. And Melissa, thank you for moderating. Thank you both for this wonderful conversation. I think it just reminds us to, you know, listen to our bodies. If we're feeling that we're stressed, we probably are stressed and we need to take action and do something about it. And I love the concept of making this like a family effort. I have a five-year-old now and she was learning meditation in preschool and I need to give, have her give me some, some lessons on this. This is a really good um, reminder to be focusing on that. So thank you so much, Mara and Dr. Moscone for joining and, and leading this conversation. I think overall, over the course of our time together so far, we've made some really important connections between traumatic events and stress. And with those considerations, learned a lot about how to maintain our brain health to ensure we can maintain this important functional ability across our lives. So let's continue with this mission of educating and empowering others. I'm really excited by, by what we have learned, um, particularly as we're, we're trying to adapt to some of these more difficult and trying times. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrea to provide some closing remarks um, as we now are wrapping up um, today's wonderful dialogue. Andrea. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, it was, um, uh, again, a very uh, big learning experience also for me. 
being in the field. And I would really like to thank um, Melissa, the speakers, um, our Braindust members, um, and our audience. I think uh, what we heard today uh, is a reminder uh, for all of us to rethink our lives post pandemic and begin to reframe a healthier version of ourselves for the future. I think we heard um, that there are um, action plans around it, that we are understanding the signs of brain trauma much better. Um, and there are things we can do directly if there are traumatic events like a war, but there, is, there are also things, and you know, my strong background in nutrition, um, which we can do for ourselves by eating better, more conscious, um, uh, doing more exercise. And I'm, again, a, not a very good example for that one, but I think there are things we can really utilize to make a better lifestyle, but also to improve our brain health. And I think this dialogue is really about providing information uh, where the science stands, um, providing information, um, what we can do, each of us, to um, have a better life, a better brain health, and what we can do for our families and our children to provide them a better future, and even in the time of pandemic and war. So our concerted action around the Be Brain Powerful campaign should really generate momentum for other like-minded organizations to adapt women's brain and mental health as an integral part of their own mission. I really hope as part of the uh, dialogue today, there will be many connections between the science, so Morali's part, um, uh, Lisa's part, and, and in fact, I really read her book and I gave the book to many of my friends. Um, but also um, then the part of um, Patricia who really does via education, providing not just education of children, but education of teachers, um, et cetera, direct impactful help in a, in a world which is not so positive. So altogether, I would like to say, uh, and close, there is hope and it's the people who, who provide this hope and it's the women who lead quite some of these very good initiatives. So I really thank uh, all these brain members. I would like to remind you that we have now started uh, to make a monthly brain wire newsletter where we will summarize today's dialogue as well and provide you the links to these various speakers. Um, and please uh, give us feedback and please spread the world uh, that there is, there are powerful women out there who want to make this world better. It sounds a bit strange maybe, but I really mean it. So our next uh, quarterly dialogue is planned in September. It will be hosted by the Yes Brain Trust. Um, and we hope that you will all join us. And for today, I would just like uh, to thank you for your time and um, encourage you to adapt our mission and the spirit to, bring, be, to be brain powerful. And um, yeah, look at your wife, uh, look at your life and see what you can do on a, daily, on a daily basis to make your brain better. So with that, I close. I thank you very much. And I thank my um, the co-organizers, all the members, and all the speakers. Thank you so much.